Mm -hmm. I'm here today uh, to talk to some very important people, people who uh, represent uh, different demographics, different walks of life, but they all contribute uh, to the greater quality of life of Escambia County. So please stay tuned, listen, as we celebrate Black History Month and the many accomplishments that our local heroes have made here in our hometown, Pensacola. Hello, thank you for joining us again um, here at Black History Month. Uh, we're very fortunate in this community uh, to have one of the greatest civil rights leaders of all time, someone who marched with Dr. King, who marched through Selma, who's probably done more than any living person uh, for, civil, for civil rights and for human rights. He's worked with John Lewis, Reverend Abernathy, uh, many of our great legends, and many times uh, people uh, don't get the opportunity to hear the real H.K. Matthews story, so it's just an honor. Uh, for Reverend Matthews to come and be on May's message, to share a little of his experiences and some of the things that he struggled with. So many of us can have the opportunity to serve, many of us would have the opportunity to teach school and get good jobs uh, because of the sacrifices that Reverend Matthews made for Pensacola and for Scammy County. Reverend Matthews, welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, my dad had a lot of admiration and respect for you and uh, I remember as a young person growing up in Pensacola to always want to be uh, in the audience when you were speaking and when you were doing sermons and um, it's just an honor and a privilege. I'm, I'm humbled uh, to have you on my show today. The admiration between you, your father and I was mutual because I had a lot of admiration and respect for him. Thank you. He was a good man. Absolutely, he was a good man. He was a good man. Reverend Matthews, there are people who are watching this show uh, may not uh, know the entire story of H.K. Matthews and, and the struggles of Pensacola, the marches, the sit-ins, the boycotts, uh, even how uh, you were arrested at, and many times your life was threatened. And so uh, I've heard the story, but I know there are some young people, some old people who are sitting at home. And so I'm just going to kind of turn to Reverend H.K. Matthews and let you start where you start uh, as we celebrate uh, this Black History Month. Thank you. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> I guess I'm a little indignant as it relates to Black History Month uh, because uh, I don't know whether it insults me or upsets me or what it does when they talk about Black History Month because there seems to be the indication there that we can talk about all of the uh, accomplishments that uh, black people have made to this country in a month's time. They gave us one month and they gave us the shortest month <laughs> in the year. And, and, and even the sh when it's a leap year, it's still the shortest month in the year. <laughs> so our history is America's history. Black history is America's history and America's history is black history. Uh, but I'm glad to be here with you on this forum today to just share a little bit with uh, a lot of people uh, in this community uh, about the struggles that we had to go through or endure uh, in the early days, back in the early 60s. And of course, a lot of the young people don't know the story. Absolutely. And a lot of the older people blame the young people for not knowing the story, but they don't teach them the story. Absolutely. So if they're not taught about the struggles, uh, then they won't know the story and they won't appreciate the story. Uh, they're not aware of the fact that uh, these stores that they're able to walk into now and see black people working as clerks and managers and that, uh, 40 years, 50 years ago, that was unheard of. Absolutely. Uh, even to be able to go into the uh, restaurants in Pensacola, uh, during that time, we had four five and dime stores downtown, five and ten cent stores, I guess, to be uh, intelligent about it. Uh, it was uh, Woolworth, Walgreen, Cresses, and Newberries. And of course, we were unable to, they had lunch counters in them, and we were unable to, uh, to go into those counters and sit down and have a meal. Uh, because we, uh, if we, but we could spend our money <laughs> there and buy other goods, but we couldn't go in and sit at the counter uh, like human beings. So a young uh, 
United Methodist preacher was assigned to uh, St. Paul United Methodist Church here in Pensacola, black. He was he was a African American, named Reverend W. C. Dobbins, uh, who came downtown for something, I guess, to buy some thread for his wife. And uh, after he'd bought the thread, he attempted to uh, get something from the lunch counter and was told that he had to go outside and go around to a side window in order to order a sandwich or order any food. And that did, just didn't sit very well with Reverend Dobbins. And uh, so he came back and uh, started talking about it and formed what was called the Pensacola Council of Ministers. I was not even a minister at that time. But uh, Reverend Dobbins uh, kind of uh, took me under his wings. And uh, as a chapter in my book that's called Awakening and Sleeping Giant. And I always knew coming up in Snow Hill where my grandmother was being called Annie and the people calling Annie were not her nieces or, or not nephews. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was being called boy even though I'd lived uh, beyond the 21 years and <laughs> makes you grown. Uh, and then if I wasn't being called boy, I was being called uncle, uh, which <laughs> it really kind of ticked me off because that made me older than I was. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Reverend Dobbins uh, organized what was called the Pensacola Council of Ministers. And his thrust was that if we cannot buy uh, food, if we cannot be served in the lunch counters in these five and dime stores, then neither should we spend our money there to buy other goods. And so he formed, the, again, the Pensacola Council of Ministers, and uh, they began what is called a selective buying campaign. We were affiliated with the NAACP. This was in 1960, 1961. Uh, we were affiliated with the N in AACP, uh, NAACP, uh, and we were not allowed to use the term boycott, so we used selective buying, that is selecting where we spent our money. Right. And uh, we made a concentrated effort to make sure that uh, African Americans or blacks did not spend their monies in areas where they were not welcome. Mm -hmm. Thus, the uh, sit-ins. We had the NAACP Youth Council, and we had young people, young students who were in high school, that we would bring down and let them sit in at the lunch counter in those four, five, and ten-cent stores. And the ministerial alliance, those of us who, and as I said, I was not a minister at that time, uh, it didn't take long for me to be converted into one. That's right. But uh, <laughs> uh, we kind of walked the picket line outside to make sure that the kids were protected <clears throat> and make sure that they didn't do anything out of sorts. Uh, the uh, white people, the white patrons, some of them uh, were burning the kids with lighted cigarettes and they were throwing acid on them. And some of the policemen, some of the Pensacola city policemen, were taking flashlight batteries off stands in the store, sticking them in the young people's pocket, and then arresting them for shoplifting. Right here in Pensacola. Right here California. in Pensacola. These wow. are the things that we had to go through. And they would not hire uh, any... Uh, Negroes or black people, Negroes at that time, they were, we were being called, to work in any uh, area in their establishments except to carry a bottle of Windex and a, a mop bucket. Mm -hmm. Call them maids back then, huh? That's what they call them, Yeah. in addition to other things. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we, uh, we concentrated on being able to eat at the lunch counters, but we also concentrated on the fact that being able to eat at the lunch counters would do us no good if we didn't have the money to pay for the food that we would buy. So that meant we needed jobs. And so we uh, ticketed the stores downtown 
and uh, there was the uh, Pensacola Merchants Association that uh, met with us and asked us to uh, lighten up off the pickets and we promised them that we would if the uh, store owners would lighten up off of their discrimination. <laughs> uh, we'd lighten up off the pickets, they'd lighten up off the discrimination by hiring uh, Negroes in responsible positions. We had one uh, black lady who y y you know, I won't call her name, mm -hmm. but she was a teacher in this school system mm -hmm. And that was Maya's shoe store over in Palafox. She slipped in the back door. Now, if it's not the truth, she told it. <laughs> she slipped in the back door to buy a pair of shoes while we were outside picketing in the front. And the merchant, uh, it was a Maya's shoe store, merchant said to her, you ought to be ashamed of yourself in here buying shoes when your people are outside picketing for better jobs. So even that, there were so wow. many white people uh, who subscribed to our cause. Mm. Uh, a lot of them did it in the background because they didn't want to be ostracized by people in their community, mm. but uh, they did it anyway. Right. But that was just the beginning. Uh, I have experienced in this city uh, because I, I was a fair-haired boy to them. They wanted me badly. Uh, so I've experienced 35 arrests. Uh, wow. I've been shipped off to the state penitentiary twice. Uh, I had eight just a few years ago. It was seven until uh, lately I found out there was an eighth. I had eight contracts out on my life. Wow. Uh, my house has been shot into. My automobile was wired to be blown up, but the idiots didn't know what they were doing, so it didn't work. <laughs> so I've had a lot of fun uh, in this town. And uh, Reverend, and someone's listening now, I don't want to break your train of thought, but uh, you've gone to jail 35 times. Uh, you've gone to prison. Uh, twice. Twice. Uh, and for what reason? Because someone's listening. I mean, because uh, it wasn't because of... It, no, not, for, not because of snatching anybody's pocketbook. Right. Uh, I went all 35 times, all 37 times, all told. I went for participating in civil disobedience. Right. Picketing. Uh, there were just little nitpicking things that they would arrest me for. Uh, illegal, unlawful trespassing, illegal assembly, anything that they could, <clears throat> they could get. Uh, to uh, uh, put me in jail. Right. Uh, they did. Now, I get all of the accolades uh, and all of the honors, uh, plenty of them. Well but, deserved. But, well, thank you. But I'm by no means the only one who made sacrifices. Uh, there were people like Reverend B.J. Brooks, Reverend Otha Leverett, Reverend Nathaniel Smith, Reverend James Young, Reverend K.C. Bass, and just scores of them. Reverend R.N. Gooden out of Tallahassee, and, of course, Reverend Dobbins. Uh, who made tremendous sacrifices, and their homes were threatened, their families were threatened. But I'm the only one who had the distinct privilege of being able to go to jail <laughs> and to go to the state penitentiary. Uh, of course, my crime when I was sent to the state penitentiary was after a young black man had been shot and killed out on Highway 29, a young man by the name of Wendell Blackwell, who incidentally was my cousin. He was shot and killed by a deputy sheriff by the name of Doug Raines, <clears throat> who claimed that uh, Blackwell had a, had a pistol. Uh, he shot him from a distance of three feet, shot him in the head. And uh, after he fell, the person who was riding with deputy Raines reached under Blackwell's head and pull out a 22 caliber pistol. Now, any idiot knows that if you're hit with a 357 Magnum, you don't just lie down. Right. You know, your hands are gonna fly or something. So we always knew that it was a drop gun. Uh, this is what really started the, uh, uh, the main thrust uh, of the uh, movement. Mm -hmm. uh, 
even all of it was 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 main, but this was the main main thrust uh, of the movement because we felt that it was murder, and we picketed uh, the sheriff's department nightly, trying to get them to do something with Doug Rains, uh, who blew Wendell Blackwell's brains out. Now, there was a young lady who worked with the Pensacola News Journal by the name of Deborah Jones, and uh, she. We found out that the, the mobile home that Deborah Jones was living in was registered. Somebody, some man disputed this. He said, I was lying when I said it was registered to Doug Raines. He said, because I didn't know what I was talking about, it was registered to Doug Raines' daddy. So, well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what the di difference was. It's anyway, in the family. Anyway, Reverend Brooks and I uh, went to visit Deborah Jones. She was a part-time employee at the Pensacola News Journal. We went to visit her, and she told us that she was in the automobile with Wendell Blackwell the night that he was killed, mm -hmm. and that she and Doug Raines were having an affair. She ran and got away when the killing was, uh, was done. Wow. But oftentimes you can talk too much. And Reverend Brooks and I had a press conference that afternoon after we talked with Deborah Jones. And we said that we had talked with her because she had to go someplace and told us to come back the following day. So we had a press conference and we said we had talked with her and we were going back to talk to her the next day. That night her body was found, wow. thrown off the viaduct over where the, I guess it's J.E. Hall Center now, yeah. they, uh, somewhere up in that area. Uh, she had been strangled and her body was thrown off and they found, they saw a vehicle in the area uh, that supposedly was registered to Doug Raines. Several years ago, the, uh, what's that, uh, Crime Stoppers? Yeah, right. Crime Stoppers. They had a big sign of Deborah Jones over on the west side someplace, and they were asking people to call. I called them, left a message, and that's been about five or six years ago, maybe more. Nobody from that organization called me back. <laughs> wow. Because I wanted to share with them the articles that I had and the information that I had about Deborah Jones. I shared it with the deputy sheriff, uh, out at IHOP about 10 or 12 years ago. And about a month after I shared it with him, he mailed it back to me in an envelope that was not, uh, had no return address on it. <laughs> so they were not really interested. But anyway, that started the real, real push. And so we started uh, chanting a chant that said, two, four, six, eight, who shall we incarcerate? And we did that on a nightly basis. And I knew that uh, the district attorney and the sheriff and his deputies would soon get tired of us. Right. And they did one night. They moved in. They gave us two minutes to disperse. They moved in. And in about a minute and 20 seconds, they waded into us with tear gas and Billy Whip Clubs and just start beating people indiscriminately, beating people. Mm. And they arrested three of us. They arrested myself, Reverend Brooks, and Reverend Leverett. And uh, they charged everybody else. They didn't put them in jail, but they charged them with uh, trespassing and unlawful assembly. And that's what they charged the three of us with. But, and they set our bond at $2,500. But when we went, no, maybe $1,000 probably. But when we went to get bonded out, they had changed the bond or had an additional bond on Reverend Brooks and myself. Our bond had been raised to $25,000 because they said uh, they arrested us for extortion extortion by threat, wow. in that we were trying to force the sheriff 
to do something against, against his will, and that was to fire Doug Rains. Because wow. we were just constantly singing the chant, two, four, six, eight, who shall we incarcerate? Rains, untrider, ask you the whole damn bunch. That's, <laughs> that was our chant. Now, Governor Askew was a personal friend of mine. We went to see him about that. And uh, he said, nobody could make me believe that HK has said this about me. And uh, so we dropped his name from the chant, but we continually said, 2468, who shall we incarcerate? And uh, we went to trial. Most of the time, I, di I didn't lead, I never led that chant. Reverend Jimmy Lee Savage, Reverend J.L. Savage, always led the chant through a bullhorn. We went to trial and uh, they played a shotgun, no, yeah they did, they played a shotgun recording of the chant that clearly showed that, because they said, we said 2468, who shall we assassinate? Mm -hmm. Never said, that was never said. And uh, when we went to trial, uh, they played the shotgun recording that clearly showed the, the chant was 2468, who shall we incarcerate? Right. Okay? And the judge said, Judge uh, Lager Green, bless his soul, <laughs> uh, said that I don't care whether they, what they said. Uh, they found us guilty. They found Reverend Brooks and I both guilty. We were released on bond. Well, I was foolish enough to uh, continue my activities, and I had a press conference. One day after that, that night, because I said, we're, going, we're gearing up now for the biggest demonstration that Pensacola has ever seen. Ralph Abernathy was coming to town. That night, the judge sent two deputies to my house to rearrest me, revoke my bond, because he said that a judge would be a fool to allow man to remain free for threatening the same thing that he's in put in jail for. I hate to use the word incarcerate. That's a terrible <laughs> word to me. I, I, can't, I can't stand using it. Well, the deputies were a little bit dumb because when they got me to the jail, uh, they told some brothers in the jail that they wish I had run where they could have shot me. Wow. Uh, Oh, yeah, I had a lot of fun. They loved me to death. Yeah, I, I can tell. Uh, so I was in jail a day. They woke me up at 2 o'clock the following morning to transport me to Lake Butler, the state uh, penitentiary at Lake Butler. One of the same deputies who had come to my house to arrest me was one of the ones who transported me. His picture's on the cover of my book who transported me to the state penitentiary. Well, I guess you know where Chattahoochee is. Yes, sir. There's a town of Chattahoochee, and there's the institution. Well, these two deputies had me handcuffed to a young white fellow. And when they got in Chattahoochee about 3.30 that morning, they got out of the car to go into a cafe, opened the back door of the cruiser. This young white fellow who I was handcuffed said to me, come on, let's run. I said, if you go, you're going to go by yourself <laughs> because you're going to catch something in trying to take me. Well, that didn't work. But when we got to the state penitentiary and they were getting ready to come back, this same young man came to me and said, I want you to know that I'm not an inmate at all. They had me handcuffed to you to entice you to run wow. so that they could shoot you and wow. say that you were trying to escape. My, what a story. And, 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 and I just say to young people, I say to old people, I say to everybody, that every day, Commissioner, every day of my life that I awaken, I thank God yes. for what he brought me out of. That's right. Because, you know, oftentimes, and I say this to our young people, 
oftentimes you go in in prison a man, you come out a woman. <laughs> now, and, and that's the truth because, but the inmates in that prison, all of them, every last one of them had heard about me, seen me on television, knew what I was in there for, and they formed a protective wedge around me. Awesome. And they would not allow anybody wow. to get close to me, including correctional officers. Wow. So that's why, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not high and lifted up. I'm not haughty. Uh, I'm just a plain old country boy from Snow Hill, Alabama, who tried to make a difference that's right. in the lives of people. And, and my, my uh, efforts and my push was not just for black people. Right. My push was for people yeah, because right. there were people, uh, again, there were a lot of white people who picketed with us, who worked behind the scene, and even those who didn't. When they came to us for help, there were some who came to us for help. Right. There was a... Um, public defender in this uh, county and public defenders generally during that time were known to just show up. They didn't really do a lot of defending. <laughs> but this defender was named Ron Shelley and Ron Shelley defended his clients as if he was being paid mm. by the client. And they started giving Ron Shelley a, a hard time. And he came to us and he asked me, he said, HK, they are after me. Is it that I'm not doing my job? I said, Ron, your problem is you're doing your job too well. Wow. And so, but I, I don't know if that's what you wanted me to talk about. If, well, it, if it isn't, I've talked about no, it. No, you have talked. No, no, no. I, I mean, listen, the reason that there have not been more questions is because I'm just so in awe, uh, HK, to share that story. Uh, when we look at the mass incarceration, particularly of African Americans now, and many times young people find themselves in jail for just doing bad things, but you, you went to jail uh, for human rights, for civil rights. And, uh, you know, I can't say enough how much I appreciate it. I mean, this local community is better because of you. But, you know, one thing I would want you to touch on before we close here. One, I want you to talk a little bit about Bloody Sunday and the March to Selma. Uh, and then I'm going to let you probably just close with one of your signature closing lines that uh, we all love so much. Because uh -oh. I just, I mean, so many times when we get here, you know, people don't realize uh, it is a living legend. And uh, you talk so much. I mean, without the help of our white sympathetic brothers and sisters, Dr. King said the movement we did, so many white missionaries lost their lives coming from the north, fighting to help getting people to the voting polls. Uh, I had Leonard and Doreen Swartz or Leonard Swartz on, yeah. uh, I mean, in their fight for civil rights. And so, I mean, in the great relationship that I know that you share with the Jewish community and, and that their help and, and, and Levin's help in helping to uh, advance uh, uh, other rights. And unfortunately, uh, we've uh, made a lot of gains, but uh, in many times, uh, you know, we still have some of the same struggles. Uh, today at my commission meeting, we talked about monuments and we talked about names. And uh, I believe that words do matter. I, I, I think that words change culture. It, it, it changes emotions and changes feelings. And so you, you've already always had comforting words uh, for this community. And so I know young people don't know a lot of them. We take them to the enactment of the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. But, I mean, you were there on Bloody Sunday. I mean, you, can you briefly just talk about it? Because people are listening. They want to hear from HK. But, I mean, can you share the experience of, uh, of Bloody Sunday on the bridge? I will. Uh, but allow me first, before I do that, to say to our young brothers and sisters, stop turning on each other and start turning to each other. We have too many of our young people who are being slaughtered by each other. Amen. Amen. This is something that needs to stop because most bad people are in the cemetery. Right. And we need to stop destroying each other. And, and it doesn't matter. I'm, I, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white. Quit killing each other. Absolutely. That is not something. And quit killing policemen. They're not. Every, every policeman is not your enemy. Absolutely. 
There's some who are there to try and protect you. And I've got people, I've got friends, and I can't, I can't do the litany of them, but I think about Fred Levins, I think about Quint Studer, I think about Clay Mitchell, I think about Troy Rafferty, I think about Mike Papantonio, I think about just oodles of people in this community who have supported my cause and your cause. Absolutely. And I mean, without fear of anything, they've just done it. That's right. So, uh, I, but no I return expected. Just for the nothing goodness. Nothing return Absolutely. expected. And I just wanted uh, to drop that nugget because I wanted our young people to know that there are some older people in the Jewish community and the white community. Uh, I think about Brian Spencer and and, and uh, Crystal Spencer. Absolutely. Uh, who have reached out to do things. But now, to get to Bloody Sunday, we were. Uh, I was a janitor at the physician's lab that was a building over on the corner of Jordan and Palafox Street. They had uh, the doctor's offices in that building. And I was a janitor, and I was, but I was still working in the movement. I was still working as a leader in the community. But when the call came out from Dr. King to go to Selma, uh, to participate in a voting rights march, in a voting rights push, I felt that if I was going to call myself a leader, that uh, I needed to go. Right. And so I got in my little 1957 pink and white Fairlane Ford, <laughs> and I drove to Selma. I drove to Selma on Saturday. We had a mass meeting that Saturday night at Brown Chapel AME Church. The plans were mapped. Dr. King was not there. The plans were mapped because he'd gone back to Atlanta for something. But Hosea Williams, Ralph Abernathy, uh, Walter Ruther, who was a labor man, a mm -hmm. white uh, labor man, all of these people, and uh, Congressman John Lewis, Mm -hmm. And I tell John now, I, I tease him when I see him, I said, if you hadn't had hair, then they would have killed you because <laughs> they, they almost beat him to death right. on, on that bridge. Right. But getting to the bridge, we lined up and we marched from the church to that bridge. That's several blocks. We started up that bridge and midway, uh, uh, Mr. McLeod or whatever the state trooper's name was, but all of the troopers and mounted policemen were there waiting for us. And they said to us, this march will not be allowed to continue. Take your people back to your church. But there was a strong determination not to turn back. And I want to tell you, like I told Bill Clinton, I was in the middle of the march. I, I said, <laughs> but we were determined not to turn back. And, and as we proceeded to go, they proceeded to come. Wow. And they start beating us with billy whip clubs and spraying tear gas and riding horses through the crowd. They had no mercy. Mm. And, and, and I got some pretty good blows on that bridge. And I, as I lay there, wondering how could one group of human beings treat another group of human beings like they were doing us, yeah. it, it was terrible. Yeah. And this is why I go back each year to be able to walk across that bridge yeah. without being beaten or harassed. Um, Reverend, thank you for sharing it. I, I, I can only imagine it brings tears to my eyes and chills up my vein. Uh, but thank you and many other young people that are listening and people uh, that are hearing your voice uh, share the story that um, Reverend Matthews and many were beaten for others' liberty, and so. Um, well, I, let me just 
do say this because there were people, and I mean, black people have got to learn to stick together, and we've got to learn to love each other and love everybody. But there are people right here in this town who said, "Oh, Matthews was not in the sit-ins. Matthews wasn't on the Edmund Pettus Bridge." Well, I've got one message for those people. It's up to you to prove that I wasn't there. <laughs> it ain't up to me to prove that, that I was there. Well, we know that you've always been there, Reverend, and uh, we appreciate it. This has been a great segment, uh, a, a great history lesson. Uh, I hope that this will be shared and viewed uh, by not only thousands, but tens of thousands uh, throughout the country uh, to know this story, to know that we have a living legend, a person uh, who went through the struggle. Uh, and the struggle is not over, and there are many of us, exactly. Reverend Matthews, that we continue to fight. Uh, and we're very thankful and grateful for those that preceded us. And so as long as I live, as long as I have the opportunity to serve as a, a commissioner, as a community activist, as long as I have the opportunity to have breath in my body, I will continue to share this story. And so as, as so often I would hear you do, uh, I'm going to give you the closing. Well, you know, I, when, I, when I look back over the things that have happened to me and to us as a people, yes, sir. the only thing that I can say, I, you know, <clears throat> I let people know this, it's, it's the words of a song, but I think it, it's apropos, I think it fits me because, you know, I, I always try to close with this by saying I, I, I've had some good days. Yes, sir. And I've had some hills to climb. I've had some dreary days and some <laughs> sleepless nights. Yeah. But, but when I look around yes, sir. and think things over, my, my. all of my good days <laughs> outweigh my bad days. I won't complain. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes my clouds hang low yeah. and I can hardly see the road. And I ask the question, why? Why, Lord? <laughs> why so much pain? Uh -huh. But he knows what's best That's for me. me. Say it for More you. than these old eyes can ever see. And so <laughs> I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I won't, won't complain. complain. God bless you. God thank you, Reverend. Thank and you. I won't complain. <laughs> thank you. So. Thank you for listening. I hope that you'll share this with others. I'm here today doing Black History Month. Uh, to honor some local heroes, as we said earlier in a segment. Many times when we think of black history, we think of Martin Luther King, we think of Rosa Parks, many times we think of just African Americans, or uh, we think of people that we see on television that become commercialized. But right here in Escambia County, we have local heroes uh, who came through segregation, who fought for integration. Many people, uh, like the people here now today with me, uh, sacrificed so I would have the opportunity to serve. So I'm honored today to have Ms. Georgia Blackman of the Gatherness Book Awareness Center, uh, a local icon, a local civil rights leader, but more importantly, a person who's passionate about helping others. Welcome, Ms. Blackman. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. We're, we're happy that you're here. And uh, to her right uh, is a, a guy that I've grown to love and hearing his story of his wife, Doreen Swartz and Leonard Swartz, uh, how they opened up a store on Palafox when African Americans uh, were not able to go in, uh, to shop and to try on hats and shoes uh, and to be able to afford uh, to go into businesses on Palafox and uh, they didn't care about what happened. They allowed for uh, people to shop at their store because they really cared for all people. Leonard, welcome. <coughs> Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we're going to just start right here. Ms. Georgia, I mean, uh, I'm honored that you're here. Uh, you've seen more, you've done more than most of us. I know people are sitting at home watching television during Black History Month. Uh, many people have taken for granted the strides and the accomplishments that we've made as a community. Uh, but it's certainly because of efforts of yours that we are a better community. So I just want to just let you, I want to just hear the Georgia Blackman story. <laughs> I don't know about the Georgia Black Mystery. In order to hear about the Georgia Black Mystery, you have to hear about the people that uh, guided and directed Georgia Blackman. Um, uh, coming up in Pensacola, uh, I was born here, and you know I love to tell my age, I'm 78 this June. <laughs> um, I sit under Dr. Um, Vernon McDaniel. Dr. Vernon McDaniel um, sued to city and county in the state for the uh, same salary for black teachers as it was for white, and he won. Mm -hmm. And he did that. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, what a lot of people don't know, Thurgood Marshall was his uh, lawyer. Uh, 
I came up under Dr. Augustus that sued the city and the county and the uh, school board and all for desegregation of the schools, and he won. Mm -hmm. And you sit here, and I sit here doing the things that we're doing because of Do uh, Mr. McMillan and nine other black men that sued the city, the county, and the school board for uh, representation. And, um, uh, and that's why, you know, you and I are both doing the things that we are doing. Absolutely. Because before that, there were no representation, African-American representation on the city, the county, or the school board. Absolutely. And the attorney said that if a agency be created, we must be represented. So when the ECUA came about, we had to be represented. Right. Ms. George, you know, I'm, I'm very humbled in, you know, that history. And you're, you're, you're sitting home and you're listening. And Ms. Blackman, one of the reasons I wanted to do this, because as you said, you're 78 years old and we want you to live for another 78 years old. But many times our young people don't value the history, the mm -hmm. oral history. Mm -hmm. And so they don't understand the struggles and, right. uh, that people went through. And so part of the message, and May's message today, mm -hmm. is that I want not only young children, but young adults and grandparents to realize how important it is to pass on the historical data and information uh, that's real. And that's you don't right. have to go to a history book. That's you're right. living it. That's right. That's you're, right. you're actually living it. And so, yeah. Leonard, we're gonna, Ms. George, we're going to come back. But Leonard, tell us a little bit about your store and the experiences you had in Pensacola. And so I, I say this, when Dr. King would talk, he said, without the help of our white brothers and sisters, then the movement would be dead. And so many times in the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act, it was white missionaries that came down from the north, Ms. Blackman, to the that's south. Right. Right. And many of those unsung that's heroes, right. Right. as we've seen in Montgomery, Right. at the museum, right. uh, the, uh, many of those white missionaries were killed right. because they were coming down to help African Americans gain the right to vote. Right. And so we do understand that uh, civil rights is not about black or white, That's it's right. about human rights. Right. It's about people that truly care. And Leonard, you're one of those people, even when we look at Jackson Square, the lynchings that happened on Palafox. And so I know uh, through talking to your wife and through you, sometimes you lost friends, you lost, you lost uh, money, uh, but you continue to do the right thing and you continue to do it to this day. So Leonard, just, just share some of your experiences with us. Well, you all are just very much my juniors. I'm 93. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a blessing to have a 93-year-old yes, on yes. May's message. Yes. And a veteran of World War II. Yeah. Uh, I experienced the, uh, the segregation, et cetera, because I was a minority of religious, of a religion in the Army in World War II was quite another story. Uh, after the war and college, I, uh, I was fortunate enough to have someone borrow $3,000 from the bank for me, which I rapidly paid back. <laughs> and I became uh, very interested in, in the, aware, of, aware of all of what we were going on here in Pensacola. And um, we, when I opened our store, of course, I wasn't married then, and uh, my first uh, my first person my, on my floor, 51, was a black person. And that black person worked for me for over 20 years. Uh, I was also asked by Sheriff Davis to uh, be a member of the Human Relations Committee, and I worked very closely with H.K. Matthews. Yeah. Uh, through his marches and et cetera, um, our meetings at the, the city hall, which is now the uh, now the a museum. Uh, I remember many instances, and I re I re know that I recall some of them personally because of of having been a person of a minority religion. So I very equally shared with what was going on and the sit -in, the original sit-ins that we had here in Pensacola. And the entire situation was uh, really, really at 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 atrocious because uh, we were living in a, in a, in a history-building era. And some... Some people, of course, were not in favor of the equality of, of, of humans. And that's mm -hmm. the whole, really the, the whole story, the equality of the, of the human race. And, of course, now so much it has progressed. And the one thing that the younger population needs to know is the fact that their forebearers suffered greatly mm -hmm. and that they need to 
carried the flag for them and continued to be respectful of what went on in the past and be respectful of what's going on in the future. And they are the people to actually, as I said before, bear the flag and make, make themselves respected by virtue of further education and their attitude to all the other people on this planet. Leonard, thank you, Leonard. And you know, the experiences that you shared, and you said the first person you had, and what year was that where you, where you hired your first African American? 1951. 1951. I mean, I tell you, that was before integration, Ms. Blackman. Yes, and so, it was. And so yes, that took a lot of courage. Yes, it did. Well, uh, you know, uh, it, w it was interesting because th th that person happened to be of, of good quality. And that's what it takes. It just takes, takes people of good quality to, to be known and be the, the forebearers of what needed to come. Uh, yep, Leonard, when I talk in, in, in earlier uh, in the pre-show, we were outside and uh, I saw Miss Georgia Blackman embrace you. I mean, you're having a 78-year-old uh, African-American woman hugging a good-looking 92-year-old white man. And, you know, that just shows relationships mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, we break down all color barriers. And when people with like minds and common themes, we can come together. And so many times people try to divide people. But when I saw the you two embracing each other, mm -hmm. I mean, it brought something to my heart and so mm -hmm. I mean I, how did y'all meet can y'all share that can you, you two share Ms. Blackman? Well, George, George actually worked for Carmen Daniels and that was a downtown store. Wow. And I I knew I knew of her through that association of, of the, working in, in the retail business. Wow. I was a, I was I was a part I was working for Carmen Daniels during the time of the march uh -huh. and uh, doing our uh, oath deliveries and uh, Brooks and all when we did that march that day I was still working for Carmen Daniels but I was a maid in Carmen Daniels our shop at that time wow. but uh, all of the people down there at that time at the store um, the majority of them was maids but <laughs> what that march did was that we was the first African American uh, sales associates that uh, the people that owned the stores at that time hired us as sales associates because we had been working for them and they knew who we were yeah. and they knew what kind of people we were. But when that march came, that's when I became uh, the first African-American sales associate for Carmen Daniels. Can you tell them a little bit? It's a, I know young people, we have a great following, a lot of young people. Tell them a little bit about that march and what did it accomplish and why did it come about? And you're saying you know, it's marching down on Palafox. As we know Palafox today, Miss mm -hmm. Blackman. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, and it came down, and that's what I say, there's a guy, a guy that a lot of people get credit, but what they don't do, what I don't hear, I don't hear, uh, I don't hear B.H. Brooks' name, I don't hear Ulta Leverett's name, and I don't hear Mr. Um, Mr. J.D. Williams' name, and those was the people that was in the march with, with us when we went down and sit at the, um, at the, at the uh, counters down, at the, at the counters down there, and so this, that march, that we did at that time, it opened up a lot of doors, not just for the downtown, but also for the black teachers and all. A lot of things happened because of that march and what we did. It really did open a lot of doors and it changed a lot of things. Um, you know, um, it really changed a lot of the segregation and it became desegregation and also, and we moved forward with that. Ms. Blackman, I, 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 I'm just, you know, just reminded of, I remember my father, Theopolis made, but mm -hmm. whenever we'd have a problem, he would call Otha Leverett, That's who, right. I still, That's who right. was still around. That's and, right. You know, Otha would just stand up and, right. and, and fight for our rights. Mm -hmm. And so people sitting at home with, with, with great jobs, mm -hmm. whether it be in corporate America right. and school administration, mm -hmm. but uh, or whether you sit as an elected official. That's right. But it was not giving. It mm -hmm. was people who sacrificed their life, mm -hmm. their quality of life, right. their finances. Uh, and many times people That's became right. isolated because they were mm -hmm. fighting well for what was right, mm -hmm. and those people are still living. And that's why it's so important to me to have Georgia Blackman on the day and Leonard Sports, because this history is history that's mm -hmm. walking around with mm -hmm. us to this day, it. that experienced it. I mean, you have someone 92 years old that went through it, 78. Uh, I think that this message should be in every school, every community mm -hmm. center, uh, because not that anyone is, uh, 
harboring any bad feelings, but just reflection and knowing mm -hmm. history That's is right. important for all of us. That's right. Uh, and so, Leonard, uh, in closing, I'm going to give you your closing remarks. First, I want to thank you. Thank you for your struggle, brother. Thank you for still being here. Thank you for your service to this country. I'm 90 plus years old. Uh, and you're still moving around and you still have the same fire in your belly that I know you had when you met Ms. Blackman many years ago. Yes. Well, it, actually, it's all, it's all been a pleasure because it, of the 30 years that I've been retired, I, I devoted all that time for working with different organizations such as the AARP, uh, Department of Elder Affairs, Inspecting Nursing Homes, and uh, the sheriff's department as a volunteer for 15 years and guardian ad litem. You know, this is what life is about. Right. Life is about getting the satisfaction of doing things for other people. Amen. That's right. Amen. And this is what the young people need to understand is that it's not all take. It's a lot of take and give because you gain respect from the rest of the community by respecting the rest of the community. And this is something people need to know. It's their responsibility to respect other people That's right. regardless of what their color is. That's right. And if you'll notice, if there's a black person that is acceptable, it's because they are respectable. Mm -hmm. And that's, this is life. And this is how it's got to play out. You just got to respect one another to make this world a living place. Make it a better place, Leonard. And I tell you, it's an honor to have you on May's message because I know that you've made Pensacola in this world a better place and you continue to do it. And thank you, Leonard, for being here. Ms. Ms. Blackman, in so many ways, we, you, you've just, you, I mean, you are a, I, mean, I say Marion Williams, but you are a walking history book. I mean, so, and I tell people, if you're watching this, you better get down together and awareness bookstore. Uh, and if you don't buy a book, you ought to be down there just listening to her talk uh, because it's a wealth of knowledge. But Ms. Blackman, so many gains uh, that we made, but in so many ways, uh, we've had, you know, many uh, hiccups and roadblocks. I mean, and so if you were talking and there are young people and there are a lot of people watching this today, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the future or, or what we can do and how do we tie all of this together to make this community a better community? Well, one of the things that I would say to the young people and to the senior citizens like me and Leonard are here today because I think that people fail to realize that there's only one people. We are Amen. all connected. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, we really do need to work together for I tell people, you know, my ancestors um, brought me and gave me this opportunity. And they basically had third grade education, <laughs> you know, and right. said, and, but they gave me and you these opportunities to do the things that, you know, that we are doing. And so in talking to the young peoples, and you know we talk to the young peoples every second, every second Saturday, and we tell them they're tomorrow's leaders preparing today. But what we do, uh, Commissioner May, we bring people like you before them because they need to be able to look up and see you, Thank the you. county commissioner, and say, hey, I can do that. That's right. I can do that. And so a lot of things that when you look at, uh, you have people today that I came from a very poor family. Exactly. But you have people today that say uh, that they, they acquaint being poor with an uh, with, 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 uh, 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 ability to not learn, a learning disability. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, when I was coming up, basically everybody across race and gender <laughs> was poor. You That's know? right. But that didn't have anything to do with our learning and our teachers cared about us and they pushed us there. Whenever, I mean, I want to, whenever you get ready for me to close, I want to recite a poem that I believe is it. And at this time, what's going on in the universe and especially in the United States, I think if we could just understand that poem and just go, you know, with that. Yep, Ms. Blackman, anytime, you know, I just want people that's listening uh, how valuable this is. Mm -hmm. I mean, to our history teachers, to have two people who've come. Mm -hmm. Remember the Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. was 1968. That's right. Remember desegregation, 1968. That's right. Um, this was many years. These mm -hmm. were adults at that time. Mm -hmm. 
And so, so many times we fail to remember and recollect all of the things that people went through. And That's so, right. Ms. Blackman, I thank you for sharing your story. Oh, yeah. Uh, the story is real. The struggle is real. Mm -hmm. uh, and you continue to fight that fight just as Leonard is doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm honored to have you on this show. Mm -hmm. I hope we run this on every television show that we have. And I hope that people are listening. I hope someone is listening right mm -hmm. now that calls somebody and say, you know, it's a great educational program. May's message today is not about Commissioner May. Uh, it's, it's about people like Leonard Schwartz and Georgia Blackman mm -hmm. who fought that we may have a better community. Mm -hmm. And so with that, Ms. Blackman, I think that I'm going to hand the mic to you and let you say what you want to say and close with your poem. I like this poem because I think that one of the things that we are doing right now, we are forgetting that all human beings are connected. And I, uh, I love Helen Steiner Rice. I love her work. I sell her work. But I took this poem to memory because it means, to me, it is what life and human beings is about. And it says, God of love, forgive, forgive, and teach us how to truly live. And someday may we realize that all the earth to see the sky belongs to God who made us all, the rich, the poor, the great, the small. And in our Father's holy sight, no man is yellow, black, or white. And peace on earth will not be found until we meet on common ground, where every man become a brother who worship God and love each other. Amen. That was wonderful. Thank That's you. a way to close. Thank you for joining me on May's message. Thank we'll you. see you next time. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Black. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Leonard. Much. Thank you both. Such an honor today. Uh, to be here to celebrate Black History Month. And many times we think about the great contributions of Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. Uh, but in our community, in Pensacola, we have some people who have done legendary things, who have broken the race barriers, who have accomplished many things in their life. And one of those people who has done that in our community, in the educational field, is the ex-deputy superintendent, former principal, former teacher, former community uh, activist, is Jerry Watson. Jerry, welcome. Thank you, Mr. May, for being here. Well, we're honored that you'd be here, Jerry. It's kind of, uh, my mother said, give them their roses while they live. And Jerry, with everything that you've done, I mean, today, I just wanted to bring you on our television show to talk a little bit about it because I believe that the history the things that have been done that we should be able in some kind of way to record that and capture that so our children may learn. So Jerry, I'm, I'm gonna let you start and just kind of talk about your career and talk about how from, you know, segregation to integration and exactly, you know, the Jerry Watson story. Sure. <clears throat> Mr. May, I had a, a very good template for my grandmother. Uh, I was, my early age education was in a one room schoolhouse where my grandmother taught uh, four grades, one through four, and the principal of that uh, particular school. Uh, there was things that I learned uh, during those times were very, bene very beneficial uh, for me as, as I was confronted with difficult situation. Uh, she always mentioned to us that everything is not going to be easy. Uh, you have to have the tenacity, the will, and want to, to get, break through those things. So that was my early instruction to made me, I think, uh, uh, prepared for those things that I was confronted with. Uh, after I left uh, Douglasville High School, which was a segregated high school, and I wanted to attend Auburn University, but at that time it was uh, segregated. Uh, but I went to a historical black college, Alabama State in Montgomery. Uh, it was during the time of the bus boycott, and uh, there was troubling times, but I felt that I had been prepared to uh, meet those circumstances and situation uh, because of what I had learned from my grandmother. She stood about four feet tall, but she was much of a woman, and she continued to teach all of us about don't let anything or anyone stop you from being successful or doing what you want to do. Awesome. Jerry, when you think, in what year did you graduate high school? I graduated from 1958 from a segregated high school. There were only 57 students in my graduating class. Uh, some of them went on to be doctors, lawyers, dentists, and, and so forth. Uh, Lumen, unfortunately, we had one microscope in my whole high school. Wow. So uh. we had to, had to share that uh, with each other. Uh, but. As, as I said earlier, uh, she told us, don't let any difficulties or obstacles keep you from achieving what you want to be. And, and I learned early on that uh, people usually are not going to give you uh, things that you want unless that you show an effort that you really want it. Right. 
Uh, when I talk to young people, I usually talk about four things. That's setting goals, uh, determination, preparation, and coping with success. Wow. That's one of our real problems, especially with some of our African-American uh, individuals that have made it and not being able to cope with success. Uh, co uh, success can be a hindrance for you as well as you not having. Right. Jerry, go back to 1958. What was the climate of the country then? The, the climate, you know, and I'm saying this, you he often hear that statement that uh, we didn't know how poor we were right. until we met children and folks that had stuff. Right. There were plenty of love, but there were certain stores, uh, S&H Crest, uh, drug stores with the fountains in them, we didn't know why we was not allowed to do that, but we did see the restroom with colored and white. Wow. And no one had to tell us not to go in there. We just watched our four parents to see which restroom they went in. But as, as I got older, it was uncomfortable for me to understand why do we have to go to the same gender, but why do we have to go to the same, a different restroom? Uh, Later on, I learned the reason for it, and uh, it's not a reason. It was the saying for it, and uh, we just learned to cope with it. So, Jerry, moving on, 1958, you leave uh, a segregated place in Alabama, and you come, you, you graduate college in Montgomery, I mean, the Civil Rights Headquarters, sure. and, I mean, you came to Pensacola. I mean, share that experience with us. When I uh, moved to Pensacola, I was married. Uh, had a son, uh, I, even though I had a teaching certificate, but Lumen, they were only paying four thousand dollars a year. Wow! When you started teaching, when I first started four thousand dollars a year. Wow! Yeah. Uh, and I knew read it on that I, I could not take care of a family with four thousand dollars a year. Wow! So I started driving truck. That's quite an experience. Uh, I ran into situations where I'd work all day and had to go around to the back of the cafeteria to eat. But let me say this to you, it's kind of comical, but it's a reality. Yes, sir. Once the, uh, uh, they were able, we were able to go in the front of the rest, uh, restaurant, I still start, kept going around. <laughs> 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 Habits, man. Yeah. Hey, but yeah, and habit I, for I, me. Uh, I met up in the Carolinas and Georgia and so forth. I met a lot of good folks in the cafeteria, and I got large portions <laughs> in the cafeteria. There was a table set up for black drivers and what have you, uh, but that was difficult. But when you work all day and went to a, a hotel and say, I, I, we don't have any room, and then I had a white heifer, and he'd come back and tell me, yeah, there's rooms there. <laughs> that was, wow. that was uh, really devastating. But my main goal was to work through the system without violating the system so that I would be incarcerated or something would happen to me. Wow. Was, it, was it heart aching to me? Yes, it was. But I wanted to make sure that I didn't further uh, cause problems by going against the system that I, as one person at that time, would have had a difficult doing something about it. Wow, and, and, you're, and you do live the American dream, and one of the reasons that I'm doing this TV show with you is because not only myself, but so many uh, young people look up to you, and uh, black, white, uh, red, yellow, uh, the work that you've done, but I mean, some young persons looking today, uh, you came 1958, a segregated Alabama, going up through Montgomery, sure. the Civil Rights Headquarter, and you start teaching for $4,000. I won't say your salary because I was able to follow you after I became one of your students, uh, but you retired as deputy superintendent with six figures. And so if someone's looking and you know, they're saying the obstacles and the challenges that we're facing, you made it through a segregated South from 4000 to six figures upon retirement. Yeah. I mean, so can you just kind of walk through that and maybe some child's listening, some young teacher's listening, sure. And how did they make? How did you do it? And, and and I think the most important aspect of that is being prepared. You you can be qualified but not certified. We went to Tallahassee for two years, seventy two and seventy three, eight of us, to get a degree in administration supervision. There was no way that I could move from a classroom into administration without certification. Uh, uh, as I said. You can be qualified, but not certified, and that can be a hinder as well. 
But I knew early on if I wanted to move up as far as taking care of my family like I wanted to, that I had to do something other than nothing wrong with a classroom teacher. I enjoyed it. I start, first started teaching fifth grade, enjoyed it. Still see some of my students now. Right. And they have ultimate respect for me. But I want to say to those individuals that have aspiration to do things that to make their life better financially and recognition, you have to have the determination and do those kinds of things that doesn't seem popular at that time. It seems to be difficult, but I don't think anything that is, is too difficult if you keep God in your life. Mm -hmm. Remember those things that your parents taught you. And I say that broadly because a lot of our children do not get the support from their parents. I was fortunate and blessed that I had uh, religious, uh, God-fearing individuals as parents. And that kind of correlate those efforts uh, as far as education is concerned. But I encourage those individuals, if they are looking at me at this time or any other time, if you have those dreams, don't let anybody be a dream killer. You can be your own dream killer by criticizing or looking at other individuals trying to keep you from being uh, to achieve. Jerry, I want to thank you for coming out today. Uh, you are a, a icon, a local hero. Uh, to, to come from where you started to where you are today and you continue to give back and educating. I know there are thousands of students who are better off, who've done great things because of your sacrifice. And so today, on behalf of District 3, the citizens of Escambia County, uh, for Black History Month, I salute you as one of our local heroes. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Thank you for being yeah. here. I'm here today with two local heroes, uh, two men who have I made it possible for people like myself to be able to serve and for other people to be able to participate in sports. Um, many times uh, young African Americans were not allowed to play uh, in public parks uh, before desegregation. And, but two of the trailblazers who have now gone famous uh, with their story that's been shown all across America because of their contributions. And not only on the field but off the field, uh, these gentlemen uh, lead in their respective places in, in, in the pulpit and in the community and through print media, but they're just great contributors to this community. And uh, many times we wait to read history once uh, our leaders are deceased. Uh, but today we have two walking leaders, uh, two walking history books that are here to share with you. So please take a little time, sit down, relax, don't turn the channel. And I'm going to introduce you to two significant great contributors to Escambia County. My first is Emily Rowe. Emily Rowe, welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Commissioner. Thank you for being here. Reverend Augustine, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner May. And so um, maybe you know these guys and maybe you don't, but I just want them to share their story. And so it's not about Commissioner May talking, uh, but it's about young people learning. And we know we have many athletes. We have the great athletes that have come. Derrick Brooks, Emmett Smith, Doug Baldwin, uh, Reggie Evans, uh, Michelle Snow. Uh, but they probably would not have gotten an opportunity had it not been for the sacrifice of these guys who sit to my right. I know watching today there are a lot of little league coaches and parents and team moms and you have to get the logistics and provide the travel as travel ball has grown. But can you imagine, in, what, what year was that again, um, Admiral? Um, 1955. Can you imagine in 1955 taking some inner city children down to Orlando? And I, I don't think people can realize the importance and significance of that, Reverend Augustine. Can you kind of talk about a little bit, how did you get to Orlando and the logistics? Well, first of all, I have to mention our coaches who were uh, men that really cared about us. First, they spent time with us that they should have been spending with their families to make us the men that we are today. And so after we had uh, been chosen to play in the Lily World Series, then um, Mr. Clifford McQueen, I don't know whether you remember him or not. I remember the name very well. He handled all the logistics for us. In other words, when we got to a and uh, they knew who we were, and they provided the food. And when we went to Orlando, they knew who we were. So we had our own hotel, motel, or whatever wow. you want to call it that. So he <laughs> took care of all of that for us. That we didn't have no problem, right. even during 1955. 1955. So that proves to me that we have a background right. of people that know how to do things. Absolutely. And so yeah. if other teams perhaps had but Panama City, Fort Walton, had have played us, we might not would have gotten there, you know. But <laughs> right. because they forfeit, 
the game. Then and why did they forfeit the games? Well, they didn't want a black and white to mix during that time. Wow. Yeah. So the reality of it was you were playing and you're going to play in the semifinals, and, but the white teams didn't want to play your team. Right. So you got the advancement. Got, got, got one by bye. So how was it funded? Who helped you all get the funding to get there? Was it just coaches and parents or community? Well, you know, they had their organization was the Pensacola JCs. Okay. And as a result, that organization had been around for some mm -hmm. time, and of course, they paid dues. They raised money from different different yeah. types of events, and they made sure that we that was enough money to get us down and back uh, at their expense, because we wasn't getting a lot of help from those who would be in charge of the overall tournament. Right. So we had to uh, rely on our coaches. Mm -hmm. And really, we can't say enough about them and the time that they spent with us, not just going to Orlando, but just yeah. helping us when we were young men, capable of getting in all kinds of trouble. Right. And they were able to kind of spend time with us. And I think about it all the time when I ride through the different parks, mm -hmm. and I see people, certainly such as yourself, Commission, and others who are working with these young people, and it, 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 it does my heart good because I know that that's what it's going to take. And we're going to have to do everything we can to get back to that village concept. Absolutely. But we just keep working to help each other. Mm -hmm. And once you help one, he'll go back or she'll go back and she'll help another. It's awesome when we think about where we are now uh, compared to where we were then. Right. No interstate driving, right? Uh -huh. Driving to the service station, you could buy that gas, but they wouldn't allow you to drink that water fountains uh -huh. and use their bathrooms. But our first major stop that we made while en route to Orlando, Florida, was at Florida A&M University. Wow. That's where we had our lunch, and that wow. was awesome. Wow. And then we made it on down 27 into Orlando. And let me say this, Commissioner. Those guys, along with us, we bonded the first time we met, but we just didn't know that. Hey, Amen. Until they came, until we went to Winter Haven for the premiere showing, and until they came up here, when we all got together, we already had bonded. It, it, it lets me know that, hey, racism is a learned behavior. That's right. You got to be taught to That's hate. Right. Uh, and we, up until this day, we still talk to each other, still communicate, because we're concerned about each other. Well, I mean, it was amazing when I saw that, you know, and this was long before desegregation or integration, uh, that these guys who came from different walks of life, but when I saw y'all, y'all was just like y'all had known each other. Absolutely. All your entire life, yeah, and absolutely. it just seemed so genuine. Absolutely. And, you know, and when we talk about uh, Reverend Augustine, uh, many of the young people who play travel ball, who are going on trips, during that era, no interstate, you couldn't, you could not go to the public restroom, Absolutely. you couldn't eat you know, Absolutely. where you wanted to eat. Absolutely. I mean, the mm -hmm. challenges, and so Absolutely. many times, yeah. young people don't understand, yeah. that's why I want this story. I want to share Admiral Leroy mm -hmm. and Reverend Augustine. Mm -hmm. You're playing on a travel team, I mean, we rent vans, mm -hmm. sometimes we fly, right. we're staying in the Marriott, uh, uh, we eat where we yeah, want we to eat. That. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some kids, you're watching this television yeah. show, I mean, and yet they still yeah. went and competed, mm -hmm. uh, and you live in the lap of luxury uh, because of their struggle. And so parents, teachers, uh, coaches, preachers, we have to share this story yeah. because if Reverend Augustine and Mr. Leroy can accomplish with all the obstacles they had, I mean, what more can you do? Absolutely. Well, I tell you, I tell you another thing that happened uh, at uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Robbins' uh, neighborhood uh, showing, and he must have said it about eight or nine times when he was addressing the kids, uh, Fred Robbins. Mm -hmm. And he kept reminding them that uh, these two gentlemen have paved the way, paved Amen. the way for us. And it just made me feel good to see him because of the work that he and his wife, Tia, are doing Absolutely. with young people. And then for him to just remind them and remind them, actually he was reminding himself too, I would imagine, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, we made a difference and that these gentlemen paved the way for all of us. And mm -hmm. That was a good feeling. It really was. It was a good feeling to hear that. Well, you know, Fred, I, I spoke with Fred uh, directly uh, after the show uh, this weekend. I was with him, and uh, he was almost in tears. And yeah. He said, man, you know, I took for granted, man. He said, but well, those guys really paved the way. And I can just tell you, for a guy that loves Little League sports, and I spend most of my time in community centers and working with children. You absolutely uh, do. I know that. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's because of y'all. Yeah. And so whenever we, we, whenever we get tired, I think about what you went through. And yeah. so when I'm having to drive to Orlando with a van full of young kids yelling in my ear, I think about y'all might not even have a radio. You know what we did? <laughs> You know, so no, we didn't have no, you know, we didn't have no thing. You phones, all your phones, iPhones. I mean, actually, I like the part. I like the part in, in the movie when Admiral says, you know. Uh, that's just the way things were. And if you had to use the bathroom, mm -hmm. you just had to go on the outside and do it. <laughs> Get back in the car and let's go. Let's keep, keep going. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know, we appreciate it. Uh, I think both of you, and, and as you said, Reverend, earlier, uh, that you sh you've done so many shows, you should get paid. But uh, I, agree, I agree with you. I'm going to be your agent. <laughs> I mean, you know, and we're not going to do this during Black History Month. We're going to do this during every month. <laughs> I'm going to be the agent. Yeah. So we should, we're we going to call Quinn Studer and see if he wants to invest in this. Yeah, we appreciate but that. But more important, mm -hmm. I, I think the greatest uh, th thing that a person can do, and, you know, I often say it's a um, 100 years from now, it won't matter your bank account, the type of car you drove, Absolutely. the size house you lived in, mm -hmm. how many times yeah. you're on, on television, but were you important in the life of a child and the legacy that you leave? Mm -hmm. leave? And yeah. you, you're leaving a rich legacy for your yeah, children and your grandchildren. I know Emily Roy has grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine in the history books, generations from now, some child's going to look up and say, you know what, I'm better off. Uh, I've traveled uh, over the country uh, promoting the documentary Long Time Coming. And it was such a fascinating event to celebrate um, and, and join in the history of that uh, game when uh, Quinn Studer brought the uh, guys from Orlando, Florida to Pensacola and we celebrated and uh, it turned out so nice until I was blessed to have all those players to worship with me on Sunday morning at my church. And I, and I think people are sitting there, I mean the significance of that team and, and I was there and was ha so humbled to be a part of the things that were happening at the Maritime Park and with you, your leadership and Quinn Studer and Adam Leroy and um, Mr. McLeod. I mean, uh, but that was a group of all white baseball players and you were a group of all black baseball players and just the camaraderie that I saw and the genuine friendship. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, well, I can say this, uh, uh, Commissioner. Actually, I didn't really, really get the significance of this uh, baseball game until they came up to shoot the first... Uh, footage uh, with us and interviewing us and it still had not occurred to me that this was the beginning of telling a story that really did become history. And I might add that uh, what was really exciting to me is that, you know, I spent almost 13 years in Hollywood, California and all I went out there to do was to make it in entertainment, music, film and so forth. And after it was decided by my mother that I should come home and spend some time with my kids, here I come back to Pensacola and then this, this great thing happened with the filming of this, uh, this documentary and I said, well, you know, I had to come all the way back to Pensacola to get into the movie. So that was really exciting for me and not to mention when uh, Quint Studer was able to bring uh, the Orlando players up and we had another uh, uh, reunion on top of the one that we had had down in Orlando back in April. So it's just been a, a, it's been a kind of a whirlwind, and, and thanks to Reverend Augustine, he has pumped in me. He said, man, you know we made history. And I just kept telling him I just haven't got my head around it, Reverend. But after seeing the film for one or two times, I can say, yeah, we made history. You yeah. did make history, and you're yeah. continuing to make history. And that movie is a long time coming. Uh, if you're watching the show today, a long time coming. I think they can get it on Amazon. Absolutely. And I know that they've, yeah. they've played it a couple times on, on Blab, mm -hmm. a, a, a long time coming. And, you know, Admiral, there's some young people that are sitting there watching, and we know particularly uh, in the minority community, African-American community, uh, a lot of our young people have achieved athletically and academically. But when I talk about Mark Witten or Charlie White, mm -hmm. or we talk about Adron Chambers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the significance that they probably would never have gotten the opportunity had y'all not decided one day to just go pick up a baseball and play. I mean, did you know at that time that you were going to make a difference in, in the we world? We had no idea, Commissioner. All I really <laughs> wanted to do was get out of Pensacola as far as having a place to travel to that I had never gone to. And, and incidentally, uh, just this past, uh, what was it, Friday, so, so, uh, we uh, so had long. a had an interview with uh, Mr. Robbins' neighborhood, Fred mm -hmm. Robbins. Uh, they showed the film to about eight or nine of his kids. Mm -hmm. 
and to see the look on their faces as they were watching the film documentary and then the comments that they made mm. after seeing the film was very, I mean, it was, it was really exciting to see that because what it said to me is that uh, that, that film did touch even them at the age that they are and some of the things they said about the film really made me feel like this is something really important and, and I'm just happy that I'm a part of, of it. So on behalf of all of Escambia County, uh, not just doing uh, Black History Month, but throughout this entire year, uh, we should recognize and we should look back and reflect and be appreciative of the contributions. Uh, so. Because many times uh, the history books do not really portray what really happened. And many times people are gone and we want to give them their flowers. Absolutely. I am glad that this community is recognizing local you, African American heroes mm -hmm. who are truly living the dream. So thank y'all for living it. And, and with that, uh, Reverend Oxine, I'm going to let you say your closing remarks, and then Admiral, I'm going to let you say it. But again, thank you for being here. Thank you for sacrificing. And, and uh, young people, you're watching this, but you know y'all make light of it. But your life was in jeopardy when you were driving those mm -hmm. roads at night and going in places to use the restroom and to eat. And so by the grace of God. We still stand. We still are able here to share that story. So thank you for sharing it. You could have been selfish and not shared that story Absolutely. and could have gone to glory. I mean, we have good friends like Raymond Reese who are dear friends who have gone. Amen. And so, yeah. you know, he would have loved to be a part of Absolutely. listening to this Absolutely. story Absolutely. today. Raymond mm -hmm. would be standing outside, you know, picking on Emma Leroy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? of yeah, of course. But he would have been mm -hmm. so touched. And mm -hmm. so I know there are people who are watching uh, who came through uh, segregation, who came through uh, a tough period of history. Uh, when things were not as well as they are now. Absolutely. And so thank you all for that struggle. So I'll, I'll let you close and I'll let Emily Roy come behind you. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, I just would like to close by saying I'm so sorry that those that had gone on before us Amen. Uh, were not allowed to witness this. In fact, when we started the shooting in 216, it completed in 218 and one of our members uh, team members was with us when we did the shooting, but went back and died. Uh, had a massive heart attack in yeah. September, Cleve Daly. Cleve. And we, we are so, so sorry for that. But his son was able to, to join us in his place, and everything turned out well. Also, uh, Robert East was one of our team members. Uh, he had deceased, but his brother came all the way from San, Ho San Jose, California. That's right to be with us and we still stay in touch. So uh, it's, it's just a tremendous thing for that, you know, that fellowship right. that we still have as a result of playing in that 1955 Little League World okay. Series. Isn't it amazing what sports do? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the yeah. relationships, I mean, people say, Commissioner, you put so mm -hmm. much emphasis on sports. Mm -hmm. Look what you, yeah. look, you're still Absolutely. with this guy from and, uh, Little League team. You know, team. Commissioner, um, that's what I said in my first interview that it didn't get a chance to be in the movie. Sports has done more for integration than the church has. <laughs> Amen. That's Even a good though point. I pastor church, but I'm just got to call it like it is. It has. It really has, you know. Uh, so it has a way to bring us together. Absolutely. And again, I want to say thank you, sir. Thank you. You know, Reverend, when you say that and people are listening and, you know, we – you know, we have hundreds of thousands of people that will be watching watching us, but I remember coaching an inner city team, and Admiral Leroy was supporting me. It was back in my Salvation Army days when I had Jordan, but I had a group of young ladies from Gulf Breeze, a group of young ladies from Addis Court, and many times the mm. parents would sit on separate ways in the bleachers because people just kind of congregate with who they know. But when we had that team, it was very affluent white girls, very uh, poor black girls. But on that team, we drank out the same water bottle, mm. We wipe with the same towel. All right. We were a team. And as you said, that's what sports can do. Yeah, sports can bring together. a community together. And so we can just take an a example from that model of how we can come together, how we can make this community better. Absolutely. Because it's not about uh, any civil rights. It's about human rights. Red, yellow, black, and white. We're Let's all precious difference. in God's sight. Amen. And so you take a little white baseball, and you put a bunch of little black kids out there, and you know what? It can change the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Admiral Leroy? Well, first of all, thank you, Commissioner, for having us. And let me just say that sports actually got me a college education. Amen. Uh, and, 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 and I can't really emphasize how important it is to get a good education, uh, whether it be in high school, going off to technical school, mm -hmm. uh, just as long as you work toward getting the education and do better, you know, in your community. And let me just close by saying I, I still often think about 
the guys who are on that team with us who are no longer with us. Amen. However, most of uh, their family members are still here, and we try to recognize and honor them wherever uh, we can. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a funny thing that happened not too long ago. I have a great-granddaughter who he just turned just slightly over a years old. And, you know, I have this tendency to do commercials every so often for the magazine that I, that I publish. And uh, my... Um, my ex-wife was sitting in the den with uh, my great-granddaughter, and suddenly she watched my great-granddaughter jump, and she <laughs> up, and it was a commercial on television showing me, and she recognized yeah. me, and she just jumped, and my uh, Sandra, who is my ex-wife, she said she thought that was the funniest thing, <laughs> and, and I add to what you were saying uh, that the idea that long after we're gone. Amen. Our kids, grandkids, mm -hmm. great grandkids, mm -hmm. great great grandkids mm -hmm. will be able to see this film documentary. Uh, I think that this is a time of celebration uh, uh, during this month. And, you know, parents, you're listening, uh, you know, pick up Out Front Magazine. I mean, there's a lot of good information that Admiral Leroy gives out. I mean, one of the oldest, if not the only African American publication uh, in Northwest Florida. Uh, and it was probably because of his motivation that he continued to give back. And so, young people, you too can make a difference in your community. Yes, you, can. you don't have to play professional sports, you don't even have to play Division I. These guys made a little league team and made a difference in the world that we live. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God you. bless you for joining us today. In closing, this is Lumen May back again, thanking you for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to listen as we celebrate many of our local heroes. Uh, although February is Black History Month, we should celebrate the great contributions uh, that these individuals have made throughout the 12 months of the year. Because the contributions, the lasting effect, doesn't go for just one month, it goes for a lifetime. So again, I want to thank uh, all of our local heroes for being here. But most importantly, I want to thank each of you that are watching. Because you too are making a difference and you're making history for the next generation. Thank you for joining me.